Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Good Stuff. We're really excited for today's guest, um, and I'm just so happy that you've decided to spend some time with us here uh, as we kick off the new guest, our first one today, a, uh, a former women's basketball coach. I'm sure many of you know her from Ashland University uh, and about eight Hall of Fames, I think she's in, too, but uh, it's, it's really good to have you. Sue Ramsey here this morning with us. How are you doing, Sue? Uh, fantastic. Uh Blessed and grateful. That's for sure. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Well, so yeah, we were talking a little bit, a friend of ours, Mike Galena connected us, of course, uh, your former assistant Robin's been on the show. So, so now it's your turn. You're, oh, you're, right. you're up and, and, and ready to go. Oh, absolutely. Um, well, Hey, I, I don't know how many people know, you know, maybe your background, but you're from Bexley, Ohio. Correct. Um, and then you're the first woman to ever receive a basketball scholarship in the Hoosier state, uh, over in Indiana. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Well, I, uh, as mentioned, I grew up in Bexley, mom and dad, my, my first and most influential mentors in my life, just absolutely wonderful people. Uh, mom went went to be with the Lord in 2010, and then dad followed one year later, uh, but my biggest fans. And uh, they both Ohio State grads, so I grew up with that. And when it came time to make the decision, of course, no recruiting back in those days. Uh, they they kind of encouraged me, Ohio State wanted me to play there, but they encouraged me to, to look other places. And when I connected with uh, basketball coach at Indiana. I wanted to play for a Christian coach. And so uh, we shook hands at the uh, Ohio State Indiana game. And that was the seal of the deal. I'm coming to be a Hoosier. So went there, played for two years under that coach. And then she left and new coach came in. And then that was the same time that the um, forces to be AIAW at that time mm -hmm. decided to be uh, okay to allow women to receive scholarships based on their athletic ability, not just their academic, which was good because I wasn't getting anything for that academic. So <laughs> <laughs> I was in the right place at the right time and uh, very blessed to receive that scholarship. That's great. That's great. So is it something that have you just, have you loved the game at a young age? Were you a late oh. bloomer? I mean, it's just, this, you, you've always loved it. I, I have. And, and again, you, you got to know, I grew up, uh, product and pioneer people call me of title nine. So uh, my story is that my parents gave me the uh, tour of taking our garbage out to the back alley in Bexley, South Bexley. And in doing so, I had the super duper grocery bag under one hand and my basketball under the other. Mm, Walked okay. the catty corner to my neighbor's garage that had a hoop on it. And about the age of five started shooting and dreaming about what it'd be like to be on a team because there weren't any teams yeah. at that time. So yeah, that's great. A, that's great. A young age and then just continued. Well, since you brought it up, let, let's dive into that title nine a little bit. I don't know how many people are maybe aware of that. So you can touch base on that, but, but just your history and your involvement with that is, is so impressive. Right. So uh, give people a little bit of a perspective into that if you would. Uh, going into high school, my, my freshman year in high school, uh, tremendous mentors there. Uh, my, my phys ed teacher, I remember my freshman year, uh, about two weeks into school, asked me what I wanted to major in in college. And I looked at her and said, Miss B, I can't find my locker. I have no idea. <laughs> and she said, well, you're going to major in phys ed. I said, cool. I get to wear sweats and play in the gym all, right. all day. That's love great. Uh, yeah, love I love it. it. Uh, the next year, uh, we only, I was only permitted to play volleyball my freshman year. I don't know why. And then the next year, uh, another teacher came with coaching experience, and then I ended up playing four sports in high school. But I, I say that because both um, Diana Ford and Charlotte Bassnett, my, my mentors in high school, got me very involved in what was going on. And at that time, my junior year was 1972. So that's when Title IX went into effect, the Education Act that really uh, or originated to help women have an opportunity to get into med school. And it came from a uh, senator from Indiana. And so then it trickled down to an area that was seeing a lot of uh, roadblocks, if you would, uh, closed doors, and that was women participating in sports. Right. So 1974, I graduated high school. And at that time, my high school coach uh, brought a lawsuit a Title IX lawsuit in 1974. Oh, wow. okay. Yeah, so I was involved with that, called home from college, give my deposition, and uh, 
uh, encouraged her along the way to fight the battle, hard battle, and uh, yeah. but made everything better. And so that's that's where it began. And then along my coaching career, I've had many wonderful people advising me along the way to kind of keep it on the front burner and to make sure that it was being adhered to, not because it was a law, but just because it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. Well, in terms of coaching, was it those mentors, maybe is my assumption, or just maybe some of those experiences that then made you want to coach? Or what was it in particular that wanted, that made you feel like, hey, I, I got to do this. I got to get into coaching, right? I mean, yeah. we're, we're wired differently and we, we, we all have those different reasons, but am I on the right path there? You are, Kevin, absolutely on the right path. They, they set great examples for me. Uh, I went to a basketball camp, Eastern Ohio basketball camp. Oh, there were the best. Two, yeah, yeah. There were two back in the day for, for women and met the, the director of that camp was Dr. Mary Alice Jeremiah, uh, first Christian coach that I had met. And uh, wow, just a, a powerful impact in my life. And our, our paths kept crossing. And I, I watched what she did and all the success she had at Cedarville and then at Dayton and Indiana. And, and so, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, just great role models in my life that encouraged me along the way in this profession and helped me grow. Yeah, that's great. Now you, I, I read on your, uh, your website and some other, some other sites just in general about you. It talks about your holistic approach to coaching. Yes. Now, I don't know how many bios I go on that it says that, you know what I mean? So I, 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 uh, I read that on more, more than one occasion. Once again, I, I just want to dive into that a little bit more. Explain to that, explain to that, um, uh, that, that holistic approach a little bit more, if you could, to people in general, kind of where you're grounded in that, where all that started and, and how that continued throughout your coaching years. Sure. Uh, Kevin, I really trace all that back to my parents. Um, mm -hmm. And again, as mentioned, tremendous mentors to me, uh, but just the way they treated people and to dive into athletics in this position that we have as coaches without having a mentality, in my opinion, of looking at it as transformational instead of transactional. And I know yeah. now there's a lot of books out about that transformational leadership and how to right. do that. At the time I was coming through and growing in my profession, there weren't as many. It just, uh, it just felt right in my heart to make sure that we are not just coaching the physical and the person when they're in our presence, but we're pouring into them to help develop them mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, and socially. And that's something that I took with me and was able to really, really blossom with at Ashland, had the support obviously of the university and that same philosophy accent on the individual, and then built that into my uh, vision for the program, my vision statement, which I call the court, if you read some yeah. stuff, the court, and then made that very public and it served as a great measuring stick. It served to help us as coaches, and we need this to be able to, in, in pressure moments, to be able to discern what's the right thing to do. And it's, it's hard, and it's a hard profession, and a lot of pressure's coming at us at different angles. But if you stay rooted in keeping that perspective and always come back to your vision and your core values of your program and what's most important, at the end of the day, it's your influence on those student athletes and the opportunities that you have. Yeah, that's great. I, I totally subscribe to that. I guess, man, I, I've got a number of questions that are going <laughs> through my head right now with what you said. Like, why do you, you were way ahead of your time, I would think, in that because it was a small few. I, I think that number has increased now. And a lot of it has to do with coaches adapting probably to this generation because it's needed more, sure. right? So it might've been out of necessity than anything else, or they were forced into that. But, but how, how do you get coaches who don't understand that to buy into that, to lead that way? Mm -hmm. Because there's some of them that, that they're there and they're there for one reason only, right? It's the left-hand column, the right-hand column, and they get right. so invested in talent and some of these other things and the culture doesn't exist. And so we have obviously coaches that listen to this. We have some small business leaders. So I think it's all right. applicable, right? Yes. So how would you speak into that, you know, for the people that don't understand or grasp that? Well, first of all, what you just said, team transcends all areas of our life. So if you're talking about putting together a team and being influential, 
as a leader on that team, it, it can be family, it can be your, your business, it's nonprofit, uh, athletics, obviously a, a big impact too. Um, buying into it, I, I think at the end of the day, when you sit back and you want to define success, uh, the lasting things, and, and a lot of this comes from, from my belief system, from, from scripture, from, from what the you know, Lord's put on my heart, but you know, it's about, you know, you put your treasure where your treasure is, your heart is, and, and that stuff's going to, that trophy's going to rust. And if you look and can have the perspective of when it's all said and done, and I have a legacy left, what am I going to be known for? Uh, and it's, it's a lot of times you hear the, you know, what's the tombstone going to read? Um, what's going to be said? And I believe that coaches are in it because they do care. And they do want to invest. Uh, it's too hard a job not to. Uh, the the, sure. the wins and losses are, are so unpredictable. You can't control. I mean, here's here's Ashton University ends their season 31 and 0 going in the tournament and they're done. I mean, who would have predicted that? And who would have right. predicted all that? So so I think when they really honestly, when people take time to look at it and to sort it out. Now, I'll back that up by saying you you have to have those things in place before you get thrown into the fire. So that's why having a vision for your program and having your core values in place is so important because that keeps you grounded and focused on the things that are most important. Plus, it gives you that opportunity to share those things with your recruits, with your right. administrators. And so when the administrator comes back, why aren't you winning more games? Well, this, this is what we're based in, and this is why we're doing what we're doing. It, it grounded, focused, rooted. Yep. Uh, I know the answer to this, um, but but what is it that keeps you there? It, it, it's your faith, right? I mean, Absolutely. because it's so hard to, you know, living that life to not get distracted or oh. not maybe, oh, I'm going to take a chance, whether it's, you know, I always think of one player, I took a chance on my assistant, talked me into it. I knew it wasn't right. And probably <laughs> that whole year, everybody else in the gym knew it. And I, you know, we made that decision to move on after that. But sometimes yep. you just make those exceptions and you got to learn. But, sure. but is that what it all comes back to for you that was able to keep you grounded, rooted? Absolutely, Kevin. And, and please know I made many, many, many a mistake. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, faith faith definitely is, is the rock and the foundation of what I I've always come back to. And yes, the, the failures have been there. Uh, I love that failure doesn't define you. It refines you. You learn from it. You, mm -hmm. you go forward. Uh, scripture talks about that all the time. And Paul talked about forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, uh, but learn from that and yeah. continue. And uh, I, I liken failures to, to being more like a, um, a bruise than a tattoo. So, I don't want to, you're, you're bringing up a great topic. So I want to stay on it okay. too, because I have this a little bit later, knowing that, you know, we're going to get into the 2013 championship run, which was phenomenal. And for those that didn't know 2012, you were the runner up. So I'm not saying that's, that's failure, but I guess it's a two-part question since you touched on it. Like how has failure shaped you in your life? You know, how has it molded you and fueled you? Um, and then what was it like during that 2012 season? Technically that was the, the fail, right? That's the final game. Like how did that motivate it moving forward? So kind of all of that coupled underneath that failure umbrella. Okay. So to answer the first, first part of that question, I think probably the biggest lesson that I learned, and if I can track everything that I said, oh gosh, I should have done that. I shouldn't have done that. That, that was a bad move that came back to communication. And, okay. um, I, I learned and with my assistant coaches and learned the hard way, uh, in, in some instances, but I, I established a rule in 2000 and I call it the sleep on it rule. And so this was based upon my temperament and how I know I have to operate, this was very freeing. And the rule goes like this. If something happens during the day that I am upset with or disturbed by, uh, say something an assistant coach did, I am going to go home that night. I'm going to pray about it and sleep on it. If I get up the next morning and it's still bothering me, we're going to have a talk at nine o'clock in the morning in my office and get everything cleared out. And that went both ways. So I established that in my hiring process from 2000 on made all the difference in the world. And, and I think that carried on. I'm not a, a big person of, of confronting, but by golly, if you're a leader and you don't confront, shame on you. You have sure. to, you have to. So 
that that communication piece was big. Now, fast forward, as you mentioned, 2012, season 11-12, we lost the very first game of the season. And uh, then we continued on a, on a nice little win streak and uh, uh, put, it, put it together and are in the national championship game. We uh, came up short. Our one and only senior, Jenna Stutzman from Berlin Highland, hit about a 40-footer with eight seconds to go to, uh, to tie the game. And uh, I remember all the fans back home were like, ah, we, we knew you were going to win. You had the momentum. And I remember standing there during the timeout talking to my staff. I looked back at my starting five and I said, no way we're going to win. We were, <laughs> we were gassed. We had given every – you talk about pouring everything out and giving all you had. It was, it was unbelievable. So we came up short. I mean, lost by six. And he, here's, here's the point if you want to divide failure and learning. We stood – as they celebrated and we waited and we waited and we waited. And I think someone timed it in the stands. It was probably four minutes as we stood and waited for them to acknowledge us. And I remember at that point, just praying and saying, Lord, let, let this sink in and let, wow. let this be something that, hmm. that each one of our players sees and learns and can grow from and me included. And then we finally got to shake hands. So the next year we come back and uh, we're good to go and we're cruising through and, and uh, um, have one loss along the way and get back to that position. And I remember lying in bed the night before the championship and, and not much sleep, but uh, j just praying and visualizing what it would be like if we do win that game and collect the title and how we wanted to make a statement and, and right. celebrate. And yeah. um, so we, we got to play that out. We had a good lead. The, the starters came out, da, da, da. And I remember there were very few that actually celebrated when that final buzzer went off, but immediately went and acknowledged our opponent. And, and to me, that's the lesson of, of humility. That's the lesson of gratitude. And to really put it on a stage. And it's one thing to talk about it, as you that's said, right. just like holistic, talk about it but to actually have the opportunity to act it out. So as I look back, um, the failure of not winning mm -hmm. that, uh, I, I think to myself, it turned into a victory. Yeah, and what, what a lesson too, I think, Sue, for those girls to carry on for the rest of their lives. I don't know about you, but it's like when I recruited, I would always tell the family, it's not a four-year decision. This is a 40-year decision. You know, right. this is gonna, you know, the things that we're implementing in their daily lives are gonna impact them forever. Um, but as you know, you, you do make those mistakes and screw ups along the way. And <laughs> I'd be really, I'd be really anxious to know, like, how did those early years of coaching, now if we backtrack a little bit, how did those help you, you know, mold you as a person and become a better coach? Uh. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll trace back to, to one in particular. Um, 99-2000, at the end of that year, uh, we won six games. And it was hard, as you know, uh, mm -hmm. just going through and keeping people apart. It, it was a bad, again, on my, on my shoulders, communication was not good between me and my assistants and, and the team. Uh, kind of a bad mix of people, a variety of things through recruiting had taken place. But I remember postseason sitting in a restaurant in Michigan because I had gone up for the uh, GLIAC tournament to watch that with my boss, with Bill Goldring, my athletic director, sitting in a restaurant. And he looked at me and he said, what are we going to do to change this? What are we going to do to get this turned around? And Kevin, you talk about mentors and people in your life. Those words were powerful. Yeah, that's powerful. As yeah, the yeah. leader, it was not like, what are you going to do? How are you going to? It's like, we, we're going to do this together. And you have my support. Wow. And it made all the difference in the world. So that, to answer your question, is something that trickles down, right? So your yep. boss is saying that to you. You, in turn, are saying that to your players. And it becomes mm -hmm. not about me. It becomes about we. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I, I, I got to think just being biased where I live. So you got a lot of these Highland girls. So that helped out, right? I mean, my, my wife's a former Highland girl. So, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Great yeah. people. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's good. I know I, I talked to that a ton to, to Robin. Uh, but man, you, when you said that earlier, there, 
isn't it as a leader, and maybe you can speak into this for the leaders that are out there right now, there's nothing worse. You know, that season you win six games, that two weeks where you don't win a game, you're on an island. I mean, <laughs> your assistants, your assistants don't believe in you. The kids sure as heck don't listen to anything. Yeah. You right. know, I mean, I, I, how would you, you know, tell people to, to be able to keep going and to build that resiliency and all that when they're going through things like this, whether it is their business right now with COVID, maybe for example, right. or, or a team that struggles. Right. Again, I'm going to go back to that one word of communication. And uh, mm. if you, you don't need a big circle, but you need a circle and you need people that are going to be in that circle that you can pick up that phone 24 seven and know that they're there for you and have people that you can talk to and are people just that can listen, that you can seek advice from. Um, they can be, uh, and I was again, blessed along the way that I had current coaches that were in the same boat that I was. And, and in fact, a couple that, had started their coaching career, head coaching career the same year I had, and we could call each other and, and share with each other. Um, again, that mentor, and, and that's the role I get to serve now, which I'm, I'm so thankful for that when I see four or five coaches' names pop up, I, I don't care what I'm yeah. doing, that, that's a priority. And so to be able to have mentors, and then I'm going to tell people that they need to be mentors too. Yeah. Um, we need to continue to invest in in young people's lives and as they're going through things and and to to keep this going because boy they as you mentioned they need it even more now than yeah. we ever did yeah i mean i just i've said it on here probably a number of times you can't do life alone you know we all have struggles and we all have our story right and i respect and appreciate both but i don't know uh, what I do without the people in my life that aren't surrounding me. And like you said, to be able to then reciprocate that to other people, I don't know that there's a, you can't put a price tag on it. You know, no. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's definitely special. Um, speaking, I guess, of, of special, just what do you, what do you attribute um, the program success to at Ashton while you were there? Uh, are, are there some, maybe key components or, or, you know, that, that, that maybe they just stick out to you that you'd suggest these people that are listening because it, it and I, and I, I say this with all due respect, I'm not really concerned about what it takes to be successful, but I'm really intrigued by the fact that you can sustain it. And you were able to do that. The people that have, you know, that you've left in place after that have been able to do that. So what are some of those things? Well, if you think of, of things that last and again, goes back to a very strong biblical concept. Are you going to build the house on sand? Or are you going to build it on a rock? Yeah. And so the rock foundation is the core values of a program. And so I work with a lot of coaches, coaches that have been coaching a long time. And I'm amazed at how many haven't actually articulated that. So I'm going to mm. go quickly mm. on the, my beliefs on this. Having your core values, first and foremost, it has to come from you as the leader. Yeah. And I have many coaches say, well, well, I, you know, I call, I called the seniors in and I talked it over the, and the assistant. No, it's got to come from you. It's got to be your value system. It's got to be what you're going to implement and, and continue to build a program on. And then it's something that doesn't, I mean, it can be tweaked, but it doesn't change because you should know yourself well enough to know what your core values are. So putting those That's in right. place and then putting them down and writing them down. Habakkuk 2.2 says, write the vision down and put it on tablets so people will know what direction to go. And so you've got to have it visual. It's got to be in the playbook. It's got to be in the team room, got in the locker room. It's got to be in your AD's hands, recruits, as I mentioned. That, Kevin, was the very first thing as I look at the program taking a turn. I knew I knew what my philosophy was. And then when I was challenged, like, okay, you know what it is, write it down. Right, right. Uh, yeah. So that was the first thing. And then we recruited to it. That became the court, so to speak, became the program. So everyone in our program, coaches, players, uh, athletic trainers, administrators, had to measure themselves by the standards of the program. So at mm -hmm. that point, I never dismissed a player from our team. The program did. That's right. That's they right. They did not adhere to those standards and mm -hmm. weren't a fit. And it doesn't make them a bad person. It's no, just no. this this is what we're expecting. This is where we're going. So yeah, that was I, first. Sorry to cut you off, but no, I think, no. yeah, it's it's just simply I remember telling a couple of kids, I mean, the train's going this way and, and your train seems to be going that way. You know, yes. you can buy a ticket to be on this train. And I think 
the one key word you didn't stress, but I can tell just talking to you and just knowing is you had a great deal of conviction with that, right? I mean, you, you were convicted in those, those values, those core values and what that standard was going to be. And you were just going to uphold people to that standard. Absolutely. I had a, yeah. a player that was on our national championship team, didn't play a whole lot, a sophomore and, and focus passion was one of our core values. And at the end of the year, I said, I, I love you to death. You're great for the two hours on, on time practice days and game day. Um, but it's not your focus passion. Mm-hmm. And, and I knew it wasn't because she was up till two in the morning designing homes. That's her focus passion. So after some conversations, she ended up transferring, not playing anymore. It was maybe more her parents' focus passion than hers. And, uh, and she three months later called me and said, coach, thank you. I'm so yeah. much happier. I, I mean, you, yeah, you can't fit the round peg in square hole. It just right. doesn't. So that was yeah. the first thing. The yeah. second thing, Kevin, that really turned the tide was, um, and I, I'm working on writing a book actually, and, and oh, I nice. tell this in the in a story in a book, I'll give you the, the Reader's Digest version here, but uh, I, I came across the booklets from Proactive Coaching, and I don't know if you're familiar with those, they're tremendous, yeah. um, Bob Brown, and, and yeah, so the one was seven captains, seven things that they need to know, sent it home with the junior, she came back senior year as a captain, and I said, coach, we're going to change something or we need to change something that we've been doing. And I said, tell me. And she said, no longer should the freshman have to carry the laundry. And I said, tell me why. And she said, because we need to start looking at those acts of service as a privilege. And therefore, those of us who have been there longest need to do that. So it was a cultural change. It was a huge pivotal change in the whole idea of serving your teammates and, and recognizing that that is the greatest act of love and selflessness to be able to do so. And it continued um, my last year coaching 2014, 15, I had Taylor Woods, my one and only senior from Wadsworth on the team. We went a lot further than we thought we would. We had some great freshmen that developed. We're in the final game of the regional tournament, one game away from an elite eight. Again, we lose that game Uh, afterwards did the press conference, Taylor goes showers with her team. I come down the long the steps, look down this long corridor in the middle of the pack is Taylor Woods carrying both bags of laundry over her shoulders. Wow. And when a freshman got to me, said, Coach, we offered to carry it, but she said, No way. This is my last chance I have to serve you as my teammates. Wow. She's been playing for eleven years, right? Yeah. And, and who's she thinking about but her teammates? And so those freshmen and sophomores, two years later go undefeated yeah. and win Ashland's second national team. Yeah, and then they're emulating that. Man, exactly. that's supposed to get, you're not supposed to get me to cry on here. <laughs> um, that, yeah. that's a, it reminds me of the, have you ever heard of Ubuntu from the Celtics? Uh, E-B-U-N-T-U. It's, a, it's an African approach to all this, what you're talking about. And, and that was really the basis of Doc Rivers, you know, with that team and you yeah. know, serving others. And so, yeah, that's what, what made, though, I mean, yeah, every, every team's different, right? That's that's the the good or bad thing every year, you know. I mean, what what made that team special, though? What were some characteristics that stood out um, that, that that enabled you to to win that national championship? Obviously, there were some things that that each player had. They bought in. I get all that, but like, what were some of those, or, or what in general would you say the best have that you've noticed throughout you know your years of coaching and now doing what you're doing? Right. Well. In the success of, of that year, I will tell you this, that if Robin Freilich's not sitting next to me, we don't win a national championship. Brilliant. Mm-hmm. And I know you've yeah. had her on. And yeah. and um, she and Jennifer Bushby was our GA, uh, constantly came up with tremendous game plans. Uh, I looked at my role as being one to protect the team. Uh, mm. it, it's hard yeah. as you we, we gain some success we we gained some momentum the town of ashland just was wonderful the whole community getting behind us and to stay focused so i looked at my role as protecting putting up that hedge of protection and keeping them focused and keeping them humble on what they were doing now that being said that's the characteristic um mm-hmm. with with a, a carrie darty pickens and a and a diver gerbeck and an Alyssa miller and a taylor woods and a lindsey tenya i mean Though Ashley Dorner, those ladies were humble. They never once wanted to get in front of a camera and talk about themselves. They never once wanted to boast about 
what they had done. They truly wanted to first and foremost give honor and glory to God for blessing them with the talents and opportunities and then to their teammates. So humility, I love the uh, humble and hungry was on our wall in our locker yeah. room. And that's so true. Yeah, that's, that's great. And so um, I'm going to go opposite and ask you not to be humble here, but uh, do, do, are you, are you biased? You know, so you've had, and I, I know that the humility part of you, you, you truly understand respect that you couldn't have done any of this without all these people. And, and, and as a result of that, you know, your name's on a lot of plaques, but was there any of those, you know, as I'm looking through some of those awards, that's really impressive. Um, was there any that really meant more, you know, for whatever reason than others? Um, Thank you for acknowledging that. Um, honestly, the Kay Yao uh, yeah. Coach Award. Um, I would have guessed that. Yeah, Kay was uh, a, a mentor of mine, a friend of mine. Uh, that that's one of those that I got to compete against, actually coached against. Mm. But but to to sit with at a Final Four in a small group setting and just pick her brain and listen to her heart and and learn from. So that. Um, that meant a lot to be mentioned yeah. in the same, same voice and same uh, sentence with hers. Yeah, I'm sure. And that award really encompasses what your approach to coaching is all about too. So very fitting when it comes to that. Um, we'll wrap up here three pointers uh, in, in a second, but I, 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 one thing I'd really be interested to know with, with you, um, Sue, is I'm always interested in hearing from others about daily habits yeah. You know, are there are there certain things that you have incorporated in your life that you'd like to share? Or once again, you know, you're around a lot of high level people or have been, you know, what are some of those daily habits that stick out that make them who they are and successful, mm -hmm. if you will? Yes, uh, I think the number one and I've gotten much more disciplined and better at this since since retiring. Uh, so I'm starting my six year of retirement, but uh, it is to take that time in the morning, start mm -hmm. your day uh, in, in a quiet place. And whatever that looks like for you, for me, it's, it's my Bible, it's my, my uh, journal, and it's, um, it's just quiet time. And uh, we ha I believe wholeheartedly we have to refuel ourselves on a daily basis. This is a new day. Let's go forth and, and just be prepared for whatever might happen, but to uh, start that day accordingly. Uh, the second thing is is the health, your personal health. And uh, I am getting up there in age. Uh, so walking has become mm. a, a great nice. thing for me to do and try to try to put the, the miles on walking. I'm thankful my treadmill's right there. Uh, I can read while I... Uh, yeah, don't, I love it. Doing two things at once like the coach, right? Absolutely. Watching film. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, you know, and if I'm walking outside, I have... Uh, I have three by five cards. I, I have uh, my new my new program program uh, vision for myself includes forty verses uh, from the scripture. So I have those memorized. So when I walk, I just continue to 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 do memory verses. But uh, reading books then would be the third yeah. one. I started off twenty twenty with uh, a goal, not knowing we'd have a pandemic, to read twenty books in twenty twenty. Uh, last week I finished book number twenty seven. So wow, uh, just just to, I want to absorb everything. I want to learn. There, there is cross between leadership books and and uh, and spiritual books and and Max Lucado on that side, and then uh, a bunch of other great writers on the other side. Uh, someone asked me the other day, no trashy novels. I said, no, no, none whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> all well, the good. I love all those. The, the quiet time is so key. We've talked about it on here. Yeah. Um, what really screwed me up, uh, Sue, was getting the dog four months ago and having that in the morning. But I'm, I'm starting to get into the routine again. I've added him to my my quiet time. Uh, well, hey, um, yeah, so the rapid fire, but if you take a little bit longer, three pointers here. So I'm going to dish it off to you here and let you shoot a couple of threes to finish up. All right. Um, if people, number one, if people could learn one thing, just grab a hold of one thing from this talk, what would you want it to be? Uh, love your players. That's good. Yeah, real good. Number two, this is to hold me accountable here. Now, what you're good at as a coach, so I expect a good answer. Um, if you could have stepped in my shoes today and asked Coach Ramsey a question, what would have you asked her that I did not ask today? Uh, that's a good one. Um, what it what it feels like to have put the program in a position that my 
I was able to name my successor mm-hmm. in Robin Fralick, the three years of success that, that she had there, uh, no surprise, but off the chart. Yeah. And then to be able to do exactly the same thing when she left for Bowling Green, because Carrie Darty Pickens was ready at that yeah. point. And then the success that she's also had. And I, I think if I look back and say, well, if you ask me what, what do you see as your legacy? Was it win that national t- title? Was it this? Yeah. No, it was, it was those, those people in place that the program, as you mentioned, keeps going. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And then finally, good stuff. You know, it's just, there's something I've always, I guess, said, and, and just in general, uh, what, what's some good stuff that you can give us here in closing? So good stuff. <laughs> good stuff. Sun came up today somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to tell you, um, this is, this is my transformational purpose statement now, is to share my life experience with others, to inspire, encourage, and motivate them to pursue their God-given purpose with joy, humility, and gratitude. So my good stuff is going to be for each leader listening to this to take time to discern what your three top core values are and what your three top areas of giftedness are. And then combine those to focus on your team, whatever team that is, and use that statement daily as a grounding point and as a motivator to do what God's called you to do. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, And, and, you know, one question as we wrap up that just came to my mind, I don't know that I'm going to ask you if you miss it, but what do you miss? About coaching? Mm -hmm. Ah, not a thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I, I'll preface that with saying, because the things that I love so much about coaching, I'm blessed to be able to continue Jim, to do. Yeah. So my yeah. business of team, uh, team building and, and motivational speaking and leadership training, those are the things that, that I was so passionate about as a, as a coach. And right. now I'm blessed to be able to keep doing that. So um, I'm, I'm grateful there's young ones in place doing the X's yeah, and O's. For sure. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's amazing how much sleep you get once you don't become a coach, right? I've, I've enjoyed it. Yeah. But Hey coach, this was, this was great. Um, thanks thanks so much for your insight. I mean, the, the, the wisdom that you've provided us and of course everybody else and how you go about it, it's, it's leaving an impact and, and I hope you realize that. So I really, I truly do appreciate you spending some time with us today. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm yeah. humbled and honored and uh, just, just pray everyone out there stay safe and keeps yeah. focused on, what God's called him to do. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Well, Hey, uh, everyone, I know you're going to love this episode and uh, keep us posted on, on your thoughts, uh, head on over to YouTube. Good stuff with Kevin. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Uh, we'll be, we'll be sending out uh, things daily Monday to Friday and, and looking forward to interacting with you. So stay in touch and until next time, good stuff. <laughs>